Welcome back, fellow nostalgia seekers. This is Howling Through Neo Tokyo, where we hold on for dear life as master mangaka Katsuhiro Otomo takes us on a wild ride through the perilous streets of a city where friends turn to enemies, covert military operations unfold in the shadows, and the radicalized resistance sets forth on a plan to sow the seeds of public dissent and topple the existing regime. Last time, we watched the Capsule Gang plan a showdown with the menacing clowns, now led by Tetsuo, who, overcome with his new telekinetic powers, is wreaking havoc on the city and suffering from an insatiable addiction. The other biker gangs have orchestrated a plot to stop his rabid rampage, but it seems that they may have bitten off more than they can chew. Meanwhile, Kanada and Kay navigate the complexities of their relationship amidst the chaos, as they spend time hiding out together in a dingy room behind Harukia. All the while, he still hides from her the special capsule that the military, the resistance, and Tetsuo all seek. The planned showdown unfolds, but not without a few unexpected hitches. The chaotic scene on the city streets culminates in a fierce confrontation on a secluded pier, where Tetsuo faces off against the combined forces of Neo Tokyo's biker gangs, led by Yamagata, his former friend and current member of the Capsule Gang. Tonight, on Howlin' Through Neo Tokyo, the stakes are higher than ever, as the narrative weaves through a tapestry of suspense, betrayals, and unexpected alliances. In the midst of this tumultuous clash, the secrets of the Akira Project and the government conspiracy surrounding psychokinetic children come closer to the surface, hinting at a deeper and more sinister plot that threatens the fate of Neo Tokyo. The stage is set for an epic showdown in the ongoing Akira saga. I'm Boy Meets TV, and tonight I'll be your guide through Neo Tokyo's tangled web of dark secrets and psychokinetic wonders. Chapter 6 My Friend, My Enemy Chapter 6 opens in the middle of the military's raid on Harukia. Colonel Shikishima questions a bartender who provided refuge to Kanada and Kei in the last episode. The bartender assures him that everything is above board, even going so far as to brandish his liquor license as proof. In a clever form of blackmail, the colonel's flunky rips it from his hands and burns it right in front of him. You'll have to pass another inspection before your license is replaced, he says. You can solve all your problems by telling us what we need to know. We then catch up with Tetsuo at the secluded pier, as he speeds in between cargo containers in an attempt to evade the trap the bikers have sprung on him. In a display of immense power, he topples over and tosses cargo containers to punish his pursuers. As he looks back, his attention slips just enough for Yamagata to blindside him. Tetsuo! He cries as he swings a helmet at Tetsuo full speed from atop his motorcycle. Crash! He misses Tetsuo but takes out his headlight. He takes a screeching U-turn and makes another run at Tetsuo, like a knight in a joust. Tetsuo darts down in a space between two cargo containers and out of Yamagata's path. He leads his former friend on a chase through the narrow alleys and into a massive warehouse. Just as he enters, he hears a loud noise behind him. The massive warehouse doors are sliding shut. He stops, catching his breath as he ponders the new development. As the doors shudder, the light diminishes until he's in complete darkness. The blinding light of dozens of motorcycle lights blazes down on him. Now he's sprung the trap for real. Now, a voice cries through the darkness. All the riders descend on him, including one who's apparently forklift certified. Tetsuo does his best to flee as the forklift lifts his bike up into the sky. Our perspective then shifts to Kay, still trying to make up ground after being ditched by Kanada and crew. In the last episode, she commandeered an old lady's Vespa, and now we watch as she uses it to maneuver through traffic deftly, causing a wreck in her wake, but never falling into any real danger of being hit herself. Stuck in the traffic caused by her stunts, we get a glimpse of the colonel, yelling at his cronies as usual. We then catch up to Kanada, who's just now arriving to the pier. He's greeted by a doubled over and weary biker who points his attention towards the warehouse where Yamagata has Tetsuo cornered. We then see the wall of the warehouse get completely blown out by the crashing forklift, sending multiple bikers flying through it. Kanada just looks on in stunned horror as several more explosions rip through the sheet metal facade of the facility. Inside, 
we see Yamagata stumbling, completely worn down, into the doorframe. Tetsuo is right on his heels, short on breath but in better shape. Yamagata falls, unable to carry his weight anymore. He crawls until there's nowhere left to go. A look of outright horror overtakes his face as a furious Tetsuo looms over him. Just then, the screeching of tires behind him steals Tetsuo's attention. It's Kanada, and he's determined to save his friend. Yamagata cries out, warning him of the risk Tetsuo now poses, but he doesn't heed him. Instead, he just makes a wisecrack about Tetsuo's complexion. I've had a little headache, Tetsuo says in his defense, beating around the bush. But Kanada just comes right out and says it. I heard you lost your mind. Tetsuo laughs, mocking him for foolishly maintaining his brazen demeanor. At this point, Otomo chooses to really hone in on Tetsuo, not only by just filling multiple panels with his embittered expression, but by getting to the core of his motivation. Just like when we were kids, no matter what we did, you always had to be in charge, he cries out. While he's having his outburst, Kanada surreptitiously grabs the gun behind his back, John McClane style. He taunts Tetsuo once again, pulling the gun on him, eliciting an even angrier outburst. He fixes his sights on his former friend, finger resting on the trigger, but he doesn't pull it. Yamagata yells to him, pleading for him to do it, but he still doesn't. Not even Tetsuo calling his bluff, telling him to shoot can get him to pull the trigger. You can't do it, can you? Because I'm your friend. Isn't that right, Kanada? Then, chaos ensues. Tetsuo lifts the forklift with his powers, sending it flying towards Kanada. He dodges, but just barely, having to dive out of the way of a falling cargo container before he can even catch his breath. He loses the gun in the shuffle, it slides across the concrete and into Yamagata's hand. Meanwhile, Tetsuo's overcome by pain from overusing his powers. He ceases his assault immediately, his hands flying to his temples as he writhes in agony. Yamagata seizes the opening, fixing the gun on him while he's incapacitated. Unlike Kanada, he's going to do it. He's willing to pull the trigger, but before he can, He's overcome by an unseen force. Tetsuo's got him with his telekinesis. His head jerks back violently as he falls to the ground. We see Kanada from his perspective for a single panel before boom, blood spatters everywhere. He's just become Tetsuo's newest victim. He falls limply into Kanada's arms. Who catches him? calling out for his fallen friend, while Tetsuo just smiles. That's it. He's taken it one step too far. Kanada takes the gun, his lifeless friend's hand still wrapped around the handle, and points it at him. This time, he means it. Boom! The force of the bullet sends Tetsuo flying back. He can't believe it. He lies back on the ground, grabbing his wound in disbelief, Kanada capitalizes on the opening, mounting his motorcycle. Tetsuo scrambles to his feet, stumbling into the dimly lit warehouse. Kanada chases after him, darting up the ramp into the air and landing in the doorway. He sets his aim for Tetsuo, who's cornered there. Keep back, he yells. Kanada ignores him, instead rushing full throttle forward. As he does, the building begins to rumble and shake. Tetsuo is using his powers to bring the building down on top of him. The rafters begin collapsing all around, but he still pushes forward. He dodges one steel beam, then another, but eventually his luck runs out and he's knocked from his bike, debris falling all around him. The focus then shifts outside, where the military's arrived. The soldiers approach the warehouse as Tetsuo stumbles out, bloody and injured. He pleads with them to tend to his wound, thinking that he'd already dispatched Kanada. But boy was he wrong. As Kanada manages to sneak up behind him with a pipe, he smashes him in the back of the head with it, knocking him to the ground. He raises the pipe once again, preparing to bring it down with all his might, 
when Colonel Shikishima's voice rips through the air. Stop! He screams out. It gets both of the boys' attention. But only Tetsuo is thinking about using the distraction to get the upper hand. He uses his powers to shove Kanada up against the wall. We can see his shirt tear and shred from the force of the powers being exerted on him. It's enough that his pocket rips open and the special capsule goes flying to the ground. Tetsuo sees it, instantly shifting his focus to retrieving it. It jumps into his hand with a single psychic tug. We get a close-up of the colonel's eyes as he realizes that it's the special drug used to help with the psychic powers, the one he uses to try and exert control over the psychokinetic children. Without skipping a beat, Tetsuo pops it in his mouth. The colonel yells at him to spit it out by telling him he'll die if he takes it, but in the very next panel, we see Tetsuo swallow defiantly. He's instantly overcome with immense pain. He cries out before falling back. It looks like he's suffocating. He becomes unresponsive. Kanada lashes out at the colonel, who responds by having his guards lock him up. We then see Kay, who's secretly observing the scene, unfold from atop of the cargo container. The colonel barks more orders, getting his guards ready to transport Tetsuo's body for analysis. When Tetsuo sits bolt upright and gasps. Everyone is in utter shock. They look on in horror as he rises like a zombie. Overcome with rage, Kanada throws off the hands of the guards and charges him. He doesn't get that far though, as Tetsuo starts wreaking absolute havoc with his powers, creating an absolutely chaotic scene of rubble and debris exploding all over the place. Reeling from the blast, Kanada sees Kay on her little yellow scooter. She beckons him, and they flee from the scene as the building collapses all around them. They almost get away, but Tetsuo brings a massive panel of ceiling down in front of the bike, causing them to crash. Kay tries to appeal to him, to spare Kanada as a friend, but he dismisses her entirely. Then the colonel tries to talk him down, at which he snaps. He uses his powers to overwhelm the colonel, sending him flying back, but the colonel doesn't relent. He rationalizes with him, asking him where he expects to get the drug from if he turns his back on the military. He even appeals to his desire for power. He finishes by requesting that Tetsuo come with him to the Esper program and assume the title of number 41. The colonel holds out a hand for him, and then the chapter ends. Chapter 7, Prisoners and Players Chapter 7 opens in the Esper's playroom, where they meet to discuss the potential of Tetsuo becoming one of them. Number 26, aka Takashi, wonders how powerful he is. As he does, we see Tetsuo back at the pier getting ready to board the chopper. He can sense them talking about him. The espers continue their conversation, where Kyoko reveals that Tetsuo is incredibly powerful, so much so that in the end, he will surpass them all. She even believes he'll be powerful enough to awaken Akira. The threat of his power inspires them to intervene, hatching a plot to dampen his psychic development. At the pier, we see that, along with Tetsuo, Kanada and Kei both got captured and transported to a military facility. We then shift to the construction at the future site of the Olympics. Ryu stands atop an iron beam, clearly working in disguise as a construction worker in order to gather intel. He observes a helipad, the military's operation, and, in the distance, the heart of all the destruction that wiped Tokyo off the map two decades prior. Fast forward to nighttime in Neo Tokyo. Ryu approaches a man in the park. This man is Mr. Nizu, the leader of Neo Tokyo's anti military resistance movement, of which Ryu and Kei are members. The two are meeting to discuss Ryu's investigation at the Olympic site. All he has to offer up is a roll of photos of a waste disposal site, which he speculates might be hiding something, but he lacks any tangible evidence. Nizu expresses his immense concern over the situation ahead. 
The military is moving with great haste to accomplish whatever it is that they are secretly working towards. All the evidence is pointing in that direction. Nizu tells him that the Resistance desperately needs information in order to formulate a plan before departing. When he gets in his car, his driver notifies him that he's received a message from Lady Miyako. And the reason he looks so scared hearing this is because Lady Miyako is a messiah-like figure in Neo-Tokyo, an immensely powerful woman with a large following and a mysterious background. We then check in with Tetsuo as he undergoes testing at the military facility. Dr. Onishi is in awe of how powerful he is, noting that his bullet wound has entirely healed already and his power level has skyrocketed. The colonel, on the other hand, is more concerned with control. He's worried that Tetsuo's attitude will make him impossible to handle, and that his very existence risks the second coming of Akira. We briefly pan to another area of the military facility where we see that Kanada and Kei are imprisoned, both of them sporting bandages after the action at the pier. Outside of the walls of the military facility, we catch up with Nizu as he meets with Lady Miyako at her temple. As he bows before her, she opens her hand. We can see the number 19 etched into her palm meaning she has some affiliation with the Espers and the military's Akira project. As the scene unfolds, we learn that she's dreamed of disaster, likely a premonition based on her relation to Kyoko. She forebodes a great and inescapable catastrophe on the horizon, one that will alter the face of the Earth. According to her, Akira's awakening is inevitable, and it will be the turning point that the Resistance needs to execute their vision of for the future of Neo-Tokyo. At the military prison, we see two guards approach Kei's cell where she sits trance-like and quiet. They say they're retrieving her for interrogation. While being transported, Kei's expressions remain steely as she scans the area for and notes various cameras and security features. They enter an elevator, and the moment the doors begin to close, the camera in the corner of it explodes. Kay then barrels into one of the guard's chests, knocking him through the doors before they shut. The remaining guard attempts to shoot her, but his arms malfunction. Kay's briefly surprised, but has the presence of mind to capitalize on the opening, striking the man with a furious elbow directly to the chin. Throughout the facility, we get brief snippets of Tetsuo, Kanada, the Colonel, and the Espers being alerted to Kei's daring escape as the facility's alarms begin to sound. Kei, having dispatched the guard in the elevator, ditches the cuffs and wields a pistol, ready to fire on anyone that gets in her way. She sprints frantically down corridor after corridor, dispatching any guards foolish enough to try and stop her. Until, finally, she reaches a dead end. Terror streaks across her face as an entire battalion barrels down on her. One of the soldiers dives in, ready to shoot, only to realize that she disappeared. In his office, we catch up with the colonel as he learns that she slipped through the guard's fingers once again. He slams his desk, classic colonel, as he berates his subordinates, unbelieving of the fact that she could have just disappeared into thin air. We briefly see her in utter darkness, illuminated by a ghostly glow, just as confused as everyone else about her disappearance and where it brought her. Dr. Onishi arrives in the colonel's office, both of them sensing that something more is at play. There's no reason to believe that the girl developed telekinetic powers out of nowhere, but there's no other explanation for her disappearance. The doctor suggests questioning Kanada, to which he replies that the boy is already on his way, and then a sudden wave of realization dawns on him, forcing him to redact his orders. He doesn't want Kanada removed from his cell after all, but he's too late, they've already let him out. Our focus then shifts to Tetsuo, who's bored with the computer game the military is using to test his powers. He leans back in his chair a book over his face as he naps, but a mysterious force catches his attention. It's Kay, 
a spectral glow surrounding her as she materializes in front of him, a pistol falling out of thin air and into her hand right after. She wastes no time before she starts blasting, trying to take him out. He flies backwards through the table, two shots hitting him in the shoulder and arm, but it's not enough to stop him. He uses his power to send tables, chairs, computers, anything he can at K, but it all just stops in midair before it can hit her, the same way threats do when he uses his power to protect himself. Tetsuo's shocked by the display, screaming out, but his scream is cut short by an explosion. K looks on at the wreckage, now in the hallway and completely unscathed from the blast. That's when Tetsuo climbs from the debris, bloody but undeterred. He begins walking her down menacingly, like a scene out of the Terminator. She runs, but he says it's useless. He uses his powers to shut an overhead door, blocking her path, as he takes time, catching up to his trapped prey. But then, Kay's form slowly shifts to transparent, and she phases through the bay door. Tetsuo is absolutely shocked again, brute forcing his way through the door in an attempt to follow her. Meanwhile, Kanada, who's being transported through the facility, falls in the path of Kay's flight, watching as swarms and swarms of military personnel maneuver in an attempt to stop her. Through a hail of bullet fire, he's somehow able to break free and catch up to her just before a door telekinetically shuts behind him. He embraces her. When she doesn't instantly rip his throat out, he should sense that something is up. But it takes a literal recomposition of physical body in order to snap him out of his horniness and make him realize that some supernatural powers are at play. They teleport together into an armory where they're monitored on camera by the colonel and crew. As the doctors replay the footage of Kay's matter transference and speculate, Dr. Onishi briefs the colonel on Tetsuo's status. We see that he's healing nicely, but exhausted from the situation. Through the doctor's conversation with Tetsuo, we learn that, despite the pain that attaining power has caused him, he still desires more. On top of that, we learn that he can sense the other telekinetic beings, which the military is trying to hide from him. And, most concerningly, he's somehow been able to learn of the existence of Akira all on his own. Chapter 8, Weapon of Vengeance Chapter 8 picks up where the last one left off, in the middle of the Doctor and Tetsuo's conversation about the telekinetically endowed, including Akira. As they're discussing Akira, the Colonel barges in, listening to the Doctor explain that, according to his understanding, the military developed him 30 years prior, and that he's undergoing a hibernation of sorts. As they speak, Tetsuo asks for confirmation that there are other people alive with the same types of powers that he has, to which the doctor vaguely confirms, giving out no specifics. Still, Tetsuo is able to guess that they're kids, which absolutely floors the colonel and the doctor. It's like I can see those kids right in front of me, Tetsuo says. Back in the armory, we see that Kay has left Kanada alone and confused as to how he ended up there in the first place. She's left him behind and is now approaching a door that says, Developmental Research, Authorized Personnel Only. The lock flips open without her even touching it. At this point, if it wasn't already, it's apparent some telekinetic influence is being enacted upon her. When she enters the room, her attention is instantly drawn by an experimental weapon. What we will soon learn is a laser. Suspicious after playing back the tape of Kay's teleportation, we catch up to the colonel as he checks up on the espers. When he enters the room, we see that all three of them are in a circle, heads bowed in concentration, their powers being used to such effect that the stuffed animal at the foot of the bed is levitating. Back in the armory, Kanada has finally caught up to Kay. He approaches her as she picks up the weapon. Testing its sights, she aims down the barrel and pulls the trigger. A red plasma beam passes right over his shoulder as the laser bores into the wall behind him, leaving it smoldering. 
Then, as if possessed, K stands bolt upright, expression completely blank. We see her look over her shoulder as if alerted by something. Then in the next panel we see Kyoko mirroring the action. It's clear. The young girl's been using her powers to control K all along. Back in the Esper's room, we witness the colonel as he attempts to foil their plot. He asks what they wish to do, to which Kyoko responds, Kill Tetsuo. A phrase which comes as both an answer to the colonel's question and an order to Kay, who is still under the girl's psychic transmission. Both the colonel and Kanada ask why they want to kill Tetsuo, to which Kyoko and Kay both respond simultaneously, explaining her premonition, how Akira will rot destruction and mayhem, and Tetsuo will be the catalyst for his awakening. Right after Kyoko is able to cryptically reveal his location, her powers fade, causing her connection to Kay to slip. Kay drops a laser when she comes to. She's got no memory and is completely bewildered at the predicament she finds herself in. Back in the Esper's room, we see Tetsuo approaching, having been led there by the doctor. He towers over the children menacingly as he hints at his knowledge of the trio. It's clear by his demeanor that he means to intimidate, which is why the colonel tries to put a stop to it, ordering him back to his room, which only angers him further, causing him to mimic his line from chapter 3, when he told Kanada off for being bossy. As Tetsuo prods the colonel for answers, he recognizes number 26, flashing back to the night of the accident that awakened his psychic powers. Tetsuo lashes out at the boy, as we catch snippets of Kei and Kanada streaking through the facility, laser in hand, hoping to stop Tetsuo before he can cause any more damage. Tetsuo, undeterred by the colonel's protestations, continues to use his powers on the espers. They work as a team in response, using their powers to send him flying high up into the vaulted ceiling. Tetsuo strikes back, however, causing Masaru's mechanical wheelchair to explode, forcing the young psychic to relinquish his grip on him. Fed up, the colonel puts himself between Tetsuo and the espers in a desperate attempt to get the psychokinetic frenzy to cease. Tetsuo's not having it though, using his powers to force the colonel helplessly onto the ground. He then steps on the man's bald head as he approaches a fallen Masaru. Kyoko, desperate, uses what little power she has left to influence Kanada and Kei's path to help them get to the espers in time to stop Tetsuo. Tetsuo, realizing what's happening, uses his powers to set Kyoko's bed aflame. It burns away in no time, leaving only the girl floating unharmed in its wake. That's when he puts it together. The other espers are using their powers to protect her. He looks outraged. But before he can go any further, the colonel attempts to intervene once more, this time unable to even rise from the ground to do so. There's something so striking about this imposing man being brought to his knees by the forces that he wrought and unleashed upon the world. Tetsuo, sensing he has the upper hand, tries to use the situation to his advantage, offering to exchange his compliance for information regarding Akira. The doctor, sensing a potential breakthrough on the work he's spent his entire career on, backs him up. But the colonel fears the danger. He knows that he can't control Tetsuo, and that awakening Akira under these circumstances poses an incredible threat. So he withholds all information, suffering the consequences, as Tetsuo brutally slams his face into the ground with his telekinesis. But Tetsuo's not concerned. He has his own ways of locating Akira. We then catch up with Kanada and Kei. It seems Kyoko has led them to the rooftop of the building, where the skylights leading into the Esper's wing are. They climb up the skylight, and when they look through, he instantly recognizes Tetsuo below. Our perspective shifts to Tetsuo, as he tells the doctor he has no intention on waiting to visit Akira. The doctor starts to protest, but he's cut short as the laser rips through the skylight, filling the room with red light. The glass shatters, and Kanada and Kay fly through, slamming onto branches of the tree on their way down, which softens the landing. 
Kaneda wastes no time, immediately training the laser on his former gangmate and blasting away. The beam misses, but he just tries again. This time, Tetsuo fires back, using his powers to send an earthquake through the foundation of the building, ripping up the floor in giant concrete slabs all around them. Kaneda, undeterred, keeps firing, even taunting Tetsuo in the process. One of the shots hits the giant cat sculpture that Tetsuo stands beneath, causing it to crumble. Kei thinks he's dead, but we then see Tetsuo, glowing yellow, falling through the night sky. He lands in a pile of junk near where a group of junkies hangs out in a burnt car. Tetsuo remarks that it was a good way to disappear, as the junkies speculate wildly on what caused the noise. Back at the military facility, Kaneda and Kay survey the scene of carnage and chaos before them. Kay, seeing the espers, realizes that it was Kyoko controlling her all along. She takes a moment to ask the girl, Who is Akira? To which the girl explains he's one of their group, codenamed number 28, and that he's hidden beneath the Olympic Stadium. While Kay's processing this, the colonel wakes up, bloody and angry. I warned you, he's awake now and we're screwed, Kanada says as the colonel turns in their direction. There you have it. Chapters 6 through 8 of Akira are in the books. This was a crazy arc with a lot of action and a lot of information about the mysterious Akira project. If you're familiar with the anime, you also definitely recognized a few things in this one. And how about our boy Kaneda? Not only did he hold his own against Tetsuo at the pier, he jumped right into the thick of things at the military facility, knowing full well what type of powers Tetsuo's wielding at this point. I uh, also love the way Otomo laid out the panels to communicate that Kyoko was controlling K as well. I thought that was really clever and effective. Uh, anyway, in until next time, if you like me, love all things Akira, manga, anime, and television, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. I release new videos every Saturday night, so stay tuned, fellow nostalgia seekers.